Hello, and welcome to Marxism for Tantra Practitioners. We are going to take a look at the science of Marxism, and yes, it is a science, and we will get to that, and look at the overlap that it has with Tantra. That may sound like a really interesting workshop, and you're absolutely right, which is why we're going to dive right into it. If you don't recognize them, we got Marx on the one side and Shiva and Shakti on the other. And we're going to look at what these characters have to do with each other. Let's jump right in. So we are going to examine terms, get clear on that, background in political economy. We're going to do a Marxist analysis of gender, and we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to do the comparison between Marxism and Tantra. And then we're going to look at some reflection questions moving right along. So let's start with the terms. We got Marxism on one side and Tantra on the other. What do we mean when we say these things? Marxism has a way that people talk about it just to mean anything on the left, leftism in general, whether that's socialism or communism. And a lot of people, in fact, will use the term Marxism when they really mean Marxism-Leninism or Stalinism. And while it is true that Marx certainly had ideas about what to do about the system of capitalism. But Marx didn't write two, three, four volumes on what to do about capitalism. Marx wrote two, three, four volumes on a particular critical analysis of capitalism. So when we're using the word Marxism in this context, we're talking about the particular kind of analysis of capitalism that Marx employs. And so that's what we mean when we say Marxism, a particular critical analysis for the purposes of this workshop anyway. You will hear Marxism used to mean other things colloquially. But specifically speaking, that's what Marxism is. And now Tantra, what do we mean when we say Tantra? So the title of the workshop is something of a kind of grabby title, right? That's the kind of idea. But when I'm talking about Tantra, really, broadly speaking, I'm talking about just sex magic in general. And moving forward, I'm probably going to be using that phrasing instead. Or sacred sexuality or conscious sexuality it doesn't have to be specifically through a an ancient Hindu mystic lens. There are other lenses of sex magic or sacred or conscious sexuality, including neo-tantra and including pagan sex magic lens and all other kinds of things. We're going to talk about all that as we go, but those are what we mean when we use those phrases. So political economy, what does that mean? That's a great question. Political economy is quite simply just the combination of politics and economics. Political economy says that we cannot look at politics without also looking at economics, and we cannot look at economics without also looking at politics. Simple example of that is that anytime you are in a working relationship with someone, whether you're the employer or the employee, you have a contract, and that contract is enforced by the state. And anytime that contract is violated, in theory, the other person can turn to the state for enforcement of the contract, but depending on what kind of political economy you live in, the state will be more friendly or less friendly to you, depending on that political economy. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of political economy that we can live in. There is socialism on the left, and there's capitalism on the right. And to be clear, socialism is not just anything that the government does. Socialism and government are not the same thing. And capitalism is not just anything that businesses do. Capitalism and businesses are not the same thing. In fact, you can have socialist businesses, like a worker-owned co-op, for example, and you can have capitalist governments. And in fact, we do in the United States have a capitalist government. So what makes something socialism versus capitalism is who is in control. And in, under socialism, the workers are in control. And under capitalism, the owners are in control. You might hear the words proletariat and bourgeoisie. Those are just words for the same thing, workers and owners. But then this brings up the question, what are they controlling? And the answer to that is that it's about who controls the means of production. And so they're always in this tug of war over control of the means of production. A couple of things that are important here is that there's no clear line where okay, now the workers have this much control, so now it's a socialist situation, or now they lost this much control, so now it's a capitalist situation, right? It's about that tension. There's no binary. The battle over control 
will always be happening in all the different ways that people can find how they can get that control. So it's not always super clear. And in fact, leftists will argue all day about whether a particular system or a particular country counts as socialist or not. So it's an active conversation, but that is the crux of it, is who is in control, workers or owners. Now, you might be asking, okay, what are means of production? Great question. Examples of the means of production include land, education, materials, our own bodies, our own selves, as well as labor. And I put labor in asterisk because that's the key one in determining whether you are a worker or an owner. If, for example, you own machinery, but don't actually do labor on the machinery, you hire other people to work on the machinery for you, and then you profit off of their labor, you're an owner, you are a capitalist. And if you don't own any other means of production other than your own capacity to do labor, and then you do that labor in exchange for a wage, then you are a worker. And so it's about whether you profit off of your own labor or the labor of others. And that determines whether you are a worker or an owner. And on this point, if you are a worker, but you support capitalism, you are still not a capitalist. A capitalist is only someone who actually does the profiting by virtue of owning the means of production and using other workers to do the labor for you. If you support capitalism, you're just pro-capitalism. Okay, so one more point of clarification to help communicate means of production is that there's a difference between personal property and private property. And so Personal property, for example, is the house that you live in and personally use. This is not a means of production. Private property, on the other hand, is the house that you rent out to other people and profit from. And that house is a means of production. Private property and means of production are synonymous under capitalism. So in that context, then, we can also see that one thing can be both. So the house that you live in and pay rent for that house is your personal property, but that house is your landlord's private property. So you can see how one thing can be both. Again, it's not a binary. It's a lot of different forces at play all at the same time. And moving forward, because we're talking about this in relation to sexuality, I also want to bring up that there are, in fact, different kinds of feminism. And there is socialist feminism and there is capitalist feminism. And what do those mean? Capitalist feminism, very quickly, says that once we have achieved equal access to the corporate ladder for people of all genders, then we have achieved gender equality. Whereas socialist feminism says that's not enough. We actually need to abolish the very system of capitalism so that no one is living in poverty in the first place. And what is important to note here is that socialist feminism also says that just the same way that white men run capitalism has not saved all white men, a all women of color run capitalism is not going to save all women of color either. So socialist feminism then seeks to abolish the very system of capitalism that it would argue, and I would argue, creates poverty in the first place. So that's some background on political economy, just so we're all on the same page as we go through moving forward. But now let's talk about a Marxist analysis of gender. This is the way that most of us think about gender today, is that we have something called the masculine and we have something called the feminine. And what we typically call the masculine we refer to aspects of the rational mind, right? We have to think very logically. Let's not let our feelings get involved in this, right? We would call that a masculine way of thinking. And then also is this like direct confrontation energy, a lot of aggressive confrontation or, or violence. We see that as very masculine. Whereas the feminine is this relational heart stuff. It's about I feel for and I care for and I want to connect with you. And that's the feminine. And then there's an indirect confrontation. There's a way gossiping, for example, is very feminized today. And we think of gossiping as very feminine. Of course, men gossip too. We just call it locker room talk. That's the different, that's the masculine way to gossip, right? But we think of the feminine as this kind of gossiping. And that's one example of indirect confrontation. And there are others as well. But what do we mean when we apply a Marxist analysis to this? There are a couple things that would make something a Marxist analysis. One is that we don't just accept that these things have existed a priori or were always there. We say, how did they come about? Where did these come from? For one thing. And then the other thing is that we especially look at how the labor system organizing the means of production, how that relates 
to the things in question. And it's not that there's just one Marxist analysis either. There's a lot of different kinds of Marxist analyses and a lot of different Marxist feminists are examining all kinds of things and in conversation with each other and disagree about all kinds of different things. So I don't mean to present this as like the one Marxist analysis of gender, but this is just a broad generalization of that kind of conversation. So with that, we look at what we think of as the masculine nize. How did we get these associations to the masculine is that we have masculinized these things. And we look at these associations that we have made with the feminine, we have feminized these things. And so why is that? And partly that's because under the system of gendered capitalism or the patriarchy that we have lived into for a long time, that has placed men in a position of decision-making power. And when you have decision-making power, now you are using your big rational brain to decide things. And so that is where that association comes from between the masculine and the rational mind is because men have been put into the position of decision power. And then once the men have decided these things, how the systems are going to work, then they need a way to enforce it. And so they put other men in charge of enforcing those things. And that is where we get the masculine associations with aggression and direct confrontation. Where that whole system then relegates women to whatever is left. And what is left is service care. We relegate women to service care for the men who are in these power positions. And then that puts them in the position of having to rely on the relational heart of trying to find connection. And that also puts them in the position of appeasement and indirect confrontation in a system of gendered capitalism of the patriarchy where women are second-class citizens. Second-class citizens cannot use direct confrontation against first-class citizens. It won't work. So second-class citizens then have to rely on indirect confrontation. And that's where they will use what we deride as sneaky ways of confrontation or going behind someone's back or gossiping. And that's also where trauma responses tend to be tending and befriending or fawning, those kinds of things in response to a perceived threat. And those are the things that women then have to employ in order to survive some threatening and traumatic situations. And so that is the origin around how we have come to associate those things with the feminine. And then, of course, you'll notice here in this system of gendered capitalism, there's masculine and there's feminine, and there's not a lot of queer, trans, non-binary happening. And that's because the system of gendered capitalism does try to create that binary and tries to enforce that binary. And it says that either you're in one camp where you support the decision power or the enforcement, or you're in the other camp where you are servicing and appeasing. I think especially Alok Manon is a great speaker to this point that the existence of trans, queer, and non-binary people threaten the very system by their very existence. Alok himself is a non-binary scholar who uh, speaks wonderfully on this very topic, and I have linked them in the resource notes. So that is a Marxist analysis of gender that I want to offer to y'all so that you can, I think, ground yourself a little bit more in where this comes from. And one final point before we move forward is that, yes, capitalism proper is only a few hundred years old, depending on how flexible you want to get with that. But history from the agricultural revolution forward has engaged in capitalist shifts since the agricultural revolution, which was itself a capitalist shift. Again, it's not a binary, right? We have capitalism and socialism in this whole tug of war. And in going through those capitalist shifts, we have gotten more and more of this gendered capitalism system, this patriarchy that has created these associations. If you're wondering, we've had these masculine and feminine associations for way longer than we've had capitalism proper. Yes, but those those capitalist shifts were in place long before we started drawing out these associations. So that is a broad overview of one Marxist analysis of gender that I want to offer to y'all. And partly because it also demonstrates how the very concept of gender is so wound up with the structure of political economy. And I really want to emphasize that there is no separating the two. In fact, one thing you'll see in that tug of war conversation between socialism and worker control and capitalism and owner control is that there is no transcending that. There's no getting out of that struggle, right? Someone is going to be making decisions about means of production. And either that person will be someone who does work or that person will be someone who does not do work. And they could be doing more or less work, but that conversation is not something you can just 
transcend or move away from. Th that conversation is always at play. And so then it's about, okay, who do we want to be in control? And what are we going to do about that? Partly, this is then a way to demonstrate how political economy and sacred sexuality and gender are all super woven with each other in the first place. But moving forward from there, we get this comparison that I want to make between what I'm calling sex magic on the one hand and Marxism on the other. So let's check it out. The way that I understand sex magic is that there are two fundamental components to the approach. One is that it is fundamentally a left-hand path versus the right-hand path. Now, if you're not sure what that means, the right-hand path says, my relationship to God is a direct one. And in fact, everything else but my relationship to God is a distraction and especially something like earthly pleasure. And so I'm going to forego all of those as much as possible because earthly pleasure is such a distraction that it can actually consume me and then I'm going to call it a sin. And the left-hand path, on the other hand, says, actually, we all have this direct relationship to God and also everything, including what we think of as profane and mundane, is also sacred. Even something, maybe especially something like earthly pleasure and especially just navigating relationships in general. There's a line from a Buddhist practitioner who says, if you think you're enlightened, try moving back in with your parents. It's easy to have a direct relationship to God when we're on our own. Own. But now that we're in relationship with other people, how do we navigate that? And so the left-hand path says that we must actually move through this world and what we think of as the stuff that maybe doesn't seem sacred. And how do we show up in that? And we can actually challenge and or facilitate our spirituality, and especially, again, in relationship with another. And that's where our true spirituality lies. So that's the left-hand path. But then there's another big feature of sex magic, which is that it is relational versus absolute, by which I mean that sex magic doesn't say, here is the one way to achieve anything. In fact, the answer to any question about how to do something is almost always, it depends. And partly, there's the relationship between ourselves and our partners. And that situation, that relationship is always going to be affected by who we are in the given moments that we're in relationship and relating with each other. But then also just inside ourselves, there is the relational aspect of the masculinized and the feminized. And especially with something like sex magic, it's not just that there is a relationship between two things, but that it's more of a yin yang swirl kind of situation, right? Where we can't even remove them from each other because they're so entangled. And that gets at the unity of opposites kind of thing. And so we have relational left hand path where we have our practices and what we do in the mundane world are in relationship with our practices with our spirituality and our relationship to God and the divine. So moving over to Marxism now, two primary features of Marxism. One is that it is materialist as opposed to idealist. And I don't mean this in the colloquial sense where it would be consumerism versus naivete, but in the academic sense of these words, what does that mean? Materialism is the idea that reality is created by physical conditions. And idealism is the idea that reality is created by ideas, our inner worlds. So if we were to extremize idealism, it would be that the entire universe is a placebo effect. So a person thinks of grass and then grass exists. That would be the extreme version of idealism. And the extreme version of materialism is determinism, that everything is predetermined and there's nothing we can do to change anything anyway. Most of us are probably somewhere between the two extremes, but that's the idea is that grass exists and then we can think about grass. That's the material view. And then the second big feature of Marxism is that it is dialectic versus dogmatic. So whereas dogmatic would say these are the features and they determine everything else, the dialectic says that these are forces that are at play with each other. In fact, very rarely in Marx will you see a statement like, a causes B. Most of the time you will see statements like A and B are in a relationship with each other and these are the forces that pull on each other. But how that plays out specifically depends a lot on the details. And in fact, for the dialectical image I want to use, I actually chose the Celtic Triskelion for a couple of reasons. 
one of which is that it gets at the interconnectedness and the relationality of it all. But then also the Celtic Triskelion uses three rather than two, like a yin yang. And I think that's so great for a depiction of dialecticism because so much of how we talk about dialectics is about what we call the thesis the antithesis and the synthesis. And so a lot of Marxism, a lot of Marx's understanding of dialecticism comes from Hegel. And Hegel said, every actual thing involves a coexistence of opposed elements. So the idea there is that basically everything contains its opposite. And if we're looking at capitalism, the big driving contradiction in capitalism is that between the working class and the owning class, for example. And so you have a thesis and then you have an antithesis and then those contradictions, those tensions are working against each other in the system. And then however it gets resolved, that becomes the synthesis. But then as soon as you have a synthesis, that's just a new thesis. And so it keeps going around like that. So that's why I really liked the idea of using the Celtic Triskelion for the image of the dialectic. But so Marx's approach to using his material analysis wasn't just saying, I'm going with materialism and I'm rejecting idealism. It was a dialectical materialism. It says that materialism and idealism, or rather the physical conditions and the inner conditions of a people, they are in relationship with each other, but I'm going to give a certain amount of weight to the material analysis, but they are in that dialectic with each other. So the science of Marxism is one of dialectical materialism. That's what Marxism is. So if you look at this now, we have sex magic or sacred sexuality on the one hand is a relational left-hand path. And we have Marxism uh, on the other hand is a dialectical materialism. When I look at these things, I see the same thing. The only difference really here to my mind is that sex magic is just looking at interpersonal one-on-one -on -one relationships for the purpose of sexual liberation, whereas Marxism is looking at a society, a group scale of things for the purpose of collective and political and economic liberation. But these two systems are using the same framework to understand their subject matter. Before we get to my big thesis on that, I'm going to show this diagram here is a great illustration of dialectical materialism. Now you'll see there's a relationship between the superstructure or the ideology of a population and the base or the means of production. And you'll see that they both shape and maintain each other but that the means of production do more shaping and the ideology does more maintaining. So they do absolutely influence each other, but the base or those physical conditions do more to create the structure for the superstructure. That's the general idea of dialectical materialism. Now, if we were to say, how would we apply this to an interpersonal relationship a la sex magic, we just have what we think of as the material conditions, our physical activity, are doing more to shape and maintain our spiritual relationship, which then our spiritual relationship maintains and shapes our physical activity. And that's the dialectic, is that they're both at play. But that left-hand path or material analysis says that it's the physical conditions give a little more weight to the situation. Now, what I find really interesting about this is that if we look at Marxism proper with the institutional analysis. Again, we see the means of production affect the ideology that there's this relationship, right? But another way to say this is property relations influence social relations. You can see property relations being at the base and social relations being at the superstructure. And when you look at it that way, you're saying relations affect relations. But what is the difference between something being a property relation and something being a social relation? The property relation is about how we relate to the things that we can own. And the social relations is how we relate to things that have personhood or people. Extrapolating from that, we get this concept that how we relate to what we objectify determines how we relate to the people that we view as equals. And what I find so interesting and compelling about that concept is that especially in this conversation around the relationship between sex magic and Marxism is that every religious practice has some kind of similar train of thought of how you treat the least of these is how you treat the divine. And that itself is a paraphrase of Jesus from Christian thought. So this idea that how we treat those 
who have little to no power, including the very things that we objectify, influencing and determining how we treat those with great amounts of power. And in fact, I also love about that is that it speaks to the value of animism or the idea that there is personhood in everything. And animism, if you are unfamiliar, is a general outlook that not just living humans have personhood, but that personhood can be extended to ancestors and dead humans, as well as animals and plants, as well as things like rocks and rivers, as well as space time itself, as well as everything has personhood. And when you view everything as having personhood, that of course is going to influence the way that we relate to everyone versus how we relate to those things that we objectify and that we call objects, especially if we think that we own them. How do we relate to something that we think we own? Versus how do we relate to something that we think has its own personhood? And in that way, then I see Marxism or dialectical materialism as being its own kind of spiritual practice. And that brings me to my big thesis here, which is if Marxism and sacred sexuality are the same kind of practice, just with different degrees of scale, then I would argue that practicing one helps us with the other, which is to say that every Marxist activist would benefit from practicing sex magic for their Marxist activism, and every sex magician or tantra practitioner would benefit in their sex magic or tantra practice in becoming a Marxist activist, because then you're engaging in the same skill set that you're applying in your own particular work. And of course, either of those things I see having their own value in and of themselves. And I want to give credit to that. So that's my big thesis for you as a Tantra practitioner to consider, is that studying Marxism and engaging in Marxist activism of some kind or another will benefit your Tantra practice. And so we come here to the reflection questions that I want to offer to you as a space to begin reflecting on these kinds of topics. And I offer the tree of contemplative practices here because there are lots of different ways to engage in reflection. And me, myself, I don't do very well with stillness contemplation. I actually do my best contemplation in movement practices. But whatever speaks to you, I encourage you to be reflecting on these questions in that way. And then this quotation from radical educator John Dewey, we don't just learn from experiences, we learn from reflecting on the experience. And that's really important that we engage in that. So the one question I offer to you is, what do my politics ask of my sexuality? Now, that may sound strange to you, but if your politics are about liberation, for instance, then what does sexual liberation look like for you on a personal level? I would ask you to consider that question. And then the flip of that is, what does my sexuality ask of my politics? And that again may sound like a strange concept, but if your sexuality is one of pleasure liberation, then what does that look like in a political context? And how might pleasure activism relate to your politics. And I would ask you the question, how would your sexuality today compare to your sexuality in a world where everyone has universal shelter, food, healthcare, education, and everyone's basic needs are met? Do you think that you will have greater pleasure, less pleasure? Do you think it won't make a difference? I suspect that it will. So I put that to you as someone who is practicing some kind of sacred sexuality to encourage you to reflect on the relationship between that and your politics. Beyond that, I offer you these resources. The ones in the lower left corner are the ones that I consider very key to go through. They're going to be what I think are very formative for mapping the layout of this land if this is new to you. But if you want to get into any of the nuances with any of these particular topics, here's a list of really awesome things that I suggest digging into on the right. And then there's another page where you can check out more detailed delves into various things as well. Thank you so much. I'm Pierce Delahunt. You can definitely check out my other stuff. Always appreciated. And I really appreciate your attention. And I hope that this has served you well. And I love these conversations. So please keep having them with others. You are more than welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.